Good morning. Oh, come on. Good morning. There we go. There we go. Hey, what a beautiful day in the Lord. It's a great day. Uh, I got some special things happening in our service, and we're going to go ahead and just kind of acknowledge uh, today's graduation Sunday. And we're going to acknowledge, uh, first of all, graduating with their masters. Allie, will you stand? I love to embarrass people, so Allie, why don't you just go ahead and stand? <laughs> all right, when was at graduated college, our Mariah, he graduated. Stand. <laughs> and Cassie Michelle. We want to acknowledge our college graduates and the master's graduates. That's great accomplishments. Uh, and what we also do is we want to acknowledge our high school graduates. Uh, what we do here for high school is we want to acknowledge them, uh, where they where they are from, what they're playing, uh, just so we can kind of know and bring them up. So we love to embarrass them even more, uh, right? So uh, Tori Johnson is actually in uh, the reserves, and this weekend is her uh, commitment to go to training. But then we also have is Roy G. Come on up. Look at it. Don't you love that you're the only one? This is awesome. How are you doing it? Yeah. So so he is he has been in this church since a baby, right? And uh, when I first came here, we, we always joked in our family, the, the cool kids, uh, Jen's kids, they're like baby whispers, right? Uh, with Ava, when she was here, she was a baby. Uh, she was always crying, and of course, Allie, she was like, oh, I'll take her, and the kid, like, you know, stop crying. And we're like, oh. And, and what I've always noticed about her, the boys is you guys are so good with any kid. And uh, I've watched you grow up, and... Uh, we have a life in cars. And so, what year's your car? Yeah. 63, Chevy. Yeah. I mean, it's not a Ford, but still, it's, it's an awesome truck, and uh, he's an awesome young man. Why don't you tell a little bit about uh, where you're graduating from and what you're planning to do? Well, I'm graduating from Winfield High School. I'm going to attend WVU in the fall and study geology. Yeah, that's awesome. We're, we're, we're so proud of you. So, I want you to know um, what I told, tell every uh, high school graduate here at the church. You know, this is your family. You, you've grown up. You know that this church loves and supports you. Um, you know that we love you. And, and I pray that as you, as you go to college, I pray that as you go to WVU, uh, that your, your light for God grows even bright. And I pray that you're there, and no matter who's around you or what class or how hard your classes get, because they will get hard, trust me, trust me. I want you to know that you have the support of Winfield Nazareth. And I want you to know is how much God loves you and how much in your life he can help you out in your times of need. And I want you to know if you ever get to that point of stress where you're like, I don't know what to do, I want you to know is we're here for you, I'm here for you. And that we will always be here for you no matter what. And we are so proud of you. We are so proud of you. And we're proud of Tori for what she's going in her life. And what I want to do today is for the, the high school graduates, I want us to gather around and pray for him and pray for Tori so she's not here. I want to ask Pastor Earl to lead this prayer. And we're going to pray for you guys. I'm going to ask for the church family. I believe in family, right? This is what our thing here is we believe in prayer and we believe in the family concept. And so we're going to gather around Roy Jean. And we're going to lay hands and we're going to bless him and pray for Tori um, as they set off into their life after high school. And that God has a hand in their lives and it continues to move them forward. Amen? Amen. So let's, let's just get here. Let's just gather around and pray. Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for what you mean to us, Lord. We thank you for this day because it's a celebration, Lord. It's a celebration of one ending and a new beginning, Lord. Lord, we pray for Roy Jean, and we pray for Tori, Lord, as they get ready to go on another adventure, Lord. 
they become a small fish in a big pond, so to speak, again, Lord. And we just pray that you'd be with them, that you'd watch over them, that you'd guide them and you'd direct them. <clears throat> and Lord, even during the hard times, Lord, we pray that they know that they can look to you when it gets difficult, when things get out of hand, Lord, or they're around uh, situations they don't need to be in, Lord. We pray that you'd guide and direct and help each one of them, Lord. Lord, we just pray that Lord, you'd move on their lives, Lord, that you'd make them an example and a light into to the world as they leave here, Lord. But let them also understand that we're, we're at, we as a church, Lord, are here for them. We're praying for them, for them. We're watching over them, Lord, and we want to the best for them, Lord, and we are always going to be here. Lord, we pray that if it gets too difficult, Lord, that they know that they can call the church, Lord, and get support and get prayer. But, Lord, we pray that you'd watch over most of all. Guide them and direct them, Lord, as they leave us. And, Lord, we pray that they have a great summer, Lord, before they go. That this might be a summer to remember, Lord. A summer that they draw even closer to you. And, Lord, that they get to enjoy before they go away from us, Lord. Lord, put your arms around them right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So another neat thing, we're just going to continue uh, moving forward in this wonderful day. So Roy Jean, years ago, your mom and dad dedicated you, and they stood in front of this church, and they made a promise that they were going to raise their kid in a certain way in the aspect, and we as a church, in this body of Christ, we believe in dedication of the baby, and that dedication, it symbolizes that the, the parents want to say, we want to raise our kid in the household of the Lord, right? Uh, they dedicate that they want their, their lives, their, their, their witness to the traits of their, their, their kid, that they want to make a commitment to raise them up and to show them God's love. And it's also a commitment to the church. We as a church body, we as a church, that we join together and say, we want to join you. We want to come alongside you and to support you as parents, right? Because parenting is not this yellow brick road where it's just an easy day. <laughs> Amen, right? And parenting, sometimes we need help of people. Sometimes we need people to give us encouragement. Sometimes we need people in our life to say, hey, can I help you out with this? Or hey, let me give you some words of encouragement in this time. There's a time where as a parent, where I'll look and I'm like, oh man, today's been a hard day and there's been guys here who you have know, been there done that and they say we got you just know this this too shall pass and i was like no oh, oh, you know and, and they were so true it was wonderful to have this church family truly adopt these these kids every sunday when we dismiss the kids to go to children's school is it not beautiful when those kids leave right because i, I love our kids I, I think our kids here they're great kids I love the ministry that we have that's happening for the kids. They get to know Jesus, but also they get to know love from us because we make a commitment as a church for them. So I'm going to ask Christian and Aaron, will you come up and you bring up your, your family? And today we're going to dedicate Liam Christian Morrison. Look at that. Isn't that adorable? Look at that. That is, that is cool. Can I say hi? Can you say hi? <laughs> no. See, I held, he actually let me hold him a couple minutes ago, and for two minutes, he didn't cry. I'm doing good. Usually, kids, I hold him, they look at me like, no, you know? And, and let me tell you this uh, today is a day where you, as parents, you, you come forward and you want to make a, a commitment to him that you're going to be faithful to him. That you were going to love him and support him and know he's going to do everything perfect. But through that, you're going to teach him the values of life. Through that, you're going to show him God and what God is to you and, and show him the things of the scripture, what we see. Also in that, we as a church, we want to come up and say is we support you. We, we love you and we stand behind you. And we want to know is how much we are proud of you guys as parents for this. Do you want to come here? 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just got really excited. And look at that. You just played a game. Though. And uh, we want to just come alongside you as a, as a family. And we want to raise you up and pray for you. We want you to know that we as a church, we will sit here and uh, be there for you when you're kind of me. And we love you guys. And so what I want to ask today is, do you guys... Are you going to raise him in the house of the Lord? Will you sit there and be there for him in this time of need? But we show him how to pray, how to be a man of God, and to be a man in the world today where he knows who he is in the Lord. Do you support that? So say, I will. Your family, if they're here today, family, will you be there to commit, to be there for them, and to support them in their time of need, and their time of support of showing him the love of God? If so say, we will. Church body, will you be there as the body of Christ, as Winfield Nazarene, will you be there to support them as parents, support them in their parenting, to pray for them, to sit there and love this child unconditionally, to be there to, to, to raise the, the kid up in the way of the Lord? If so, will the church body say, we will? Yeah. I'm going to pray, and if you're welcome to come up and lay hands around too, I'll invite you guys up. But I, I, I went and got this fresh rose. And we do this as a symbol for you to keep, but also the purity in our as a, as a show of promise of our commitment and your commitment to lead, that you are going to be there to show him the light of the Lord in his life. Let us pray. If you are welcome to come up if you want. Father in heaven, God, I thank you for today. Lord, I thank you for this beautiful and handsome young man, Liam. Lord, I pray for Liam Christian Morrison, that God, he can grow up into the ways of the Lord, that his family loves him and shows him the way to the cross. Lord, I pray that you continue to bless his family. Lord, I pray that you continue to grow closer together through you. Lord, I pray for your grace and your mercy. Lord, I pray for the power and your grace to just continue to grow them in parenting. Show them how to lead them in the way of the Lord. God, I pray for the family here behind them, that they can love and support them in this time. Lord, I pray for the church, that we can continue in our commitment to love Liam and to support him as he grows up in the church. Father, I pray today for this family. Lord, I pray that they come with this commitment to raise Liam up in the way of the Lord. Lord, we support that, and Lord, this is a promise that we make. Lord, we love you. Your wonderful name. And everyone says, Amen. Amen. See, he was trying to say Amen. See that? Yeah? All right, thank you. Love you guys so much. Amen. Ushers, will you come up? A beautiful day. This is, man, what a. What a wonderful day. I love days like this, where it's just a beautiful day to recognize and to show, you know, how, how awesome is that, right? That, that, isn't that beautiful? That's just, I love the fact that we as a church get that moment. The reason why we do baby dedication, the reason why is because we, we find it important to, to make that act to say, we support you and wanting to raise your kid a certain way. And we will join you as parents and as, as brothers and sisters in Christ and do whatever we can to help you in that. And, and I love it. I, I think there's no more beautiful comment that you can make and say is we want to dedicate and say that we're going to raise our household in the way of the Lord. And it's not easy. Right? It's, it's not easy. But at the same time, it's, it's the most rewarding and beautiful thing that we can do as a church. Amen. Amen. Let's, uh, let's do our tithe and offering and let us pray. Father, as we come today, Lord, we, we lift your name on high. Lord, we, we give you glory and praise. Lord, I, I thank you for this time where we can come and give our, our offering of praise. For Lord, you have blessed us. Lord, we are blessed. And I, and I pray for this offering today. That God, we can take this offering and we can use it for your kingdom. Lord, I, I pray that you take this our blessing and that God, we can use it for your glory. God, I, I pray today that your name is glorified. For you are worthy to be praised. Father, we praise you in your wonderful and your glorious name. 
Lord, your spirit is sweet. Lord, may we fill your presence. And God, we thank you for that. Lord, may we thank you for the, 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 the Pentecost Sunday. That we can come as a church and celebrate its fullness and its calling of God to be in you. Lord, I thank you for your spirit that draws us together. Lord, I thank you for the spirit that draws us to salvation and conviction. Lord, I thank you for your love. For God, it loves us so much that it gave up your life for us. Lord, we love you. We are not worthy of your love. But you loved us still. Because God, you are love. Lord, we love you. Lord, we glorify you. Lord, we give you praise in the name of Jesus. We praise you. We pray. Amen. Amen. Kids, you are this best. Forge, uh, where you know George Washington prayed is what they say, and it's just 
It's beautiful. And I would go there on my days off just so I could look at their stained glass windows, right? And the look, it, was just, it was beautiful to look at that church. So I love Pentecost, right? And Acts, it talks about the early church, it talks about uh, where we are, is where we get our heritage as churches, right? And our purpose as a church. What is our purpose as a church? Because I think a church without a purpose is lost. And I think we should have a call and a mission statement. I think we should have this, this conviction that as Christians that when we come together and as a church, there's things that we should be doing. Amen? Right? They're like serving and helping each other and worshiping and, and discipling. This is why we, we truly try to strive in, in, in those areas. So in Acts, we're going to look at Acts 2. Let's do Acts 2, 1 through 4 first, right? Let's read this. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. All right? I love that. That's the kicking off of Pentecost. Now let's go down to chapter 2 to 42 through 47. All right? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Right here. Stop. Go back. Right here. That right there is the basis of the early church. Right? What we see in the very part of the in Acts, we start to talk about the church, where church came out of, right? It relates to this. This is the early church. This is what we do today still. One thing that we're really great at is breaking bread with each other, right? That's what we do. What we need to have a pop up. But this is absolutely what I love about this. In Acts, it goes on and says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe. Many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. Amen. Wonderful, isn't it? Let's pray. Father in heaven, God, I pray for today's word. Lord, on the day of Pentecost, let us see your, your, your holiness. Let us see your, your call of sanctification. Let us see your love and desire for us as a church. And Lord, I pray that your spirit today, it ignites a fire in us as Christians and as a church. That God, we want to proclaim your name because God, you are worthy of that. We come in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I love this in Acts, right? Acts 2. You have the, the day of Pentecost, and it leads in, into the early church movement. And I love that. It's, it's beautiful. But what's the greatest event uh, in history, right? Is what? Why don't we just celebrate the Super Bowl of of Christianity was Easter. Easter, right? Dude, I tell you, I get excited for Easter. <laughs> Easter is our Super Bowl. We, we get pumped for Easter. We we celebrate Easter. We all dress so nice. And, and we, we celebrate the, the goodness of Christ's resurrection for what it means to us, right? And when the resurrection of Christ is the, the keystone to our salvation. If it wasn't for that, there would be nothing to rest our salvation on. Our salvation rested on Christ rising from the grave. If you remove it, the whole structure of salvation, it crumbles in the dust. So the good news of the gospel is that Christ died for our sins and that he rose again. Right? The resurrection of Christ is, is proof of that, of his death, atoned for sin. When Jesus arose, we see that it completely met redemption's cross. Right? When he cried, he said, it is finished. When he cried on the cross, the work was fully done. 
Because Christ did not remain in the tomb, but what did he do? He what? Conquered death. I love that when we see that. He conquered death by rising again. We can live in the joy of salvation provided by a risen, living, and a coming Redeemer. Right? So we have faith, we have the love, and we have hope. And in today's world, those are the three things that we need the most. Amen? How beautiful is that? That event we celebrated a few weeks ago at Easter, man, we go all out. We celebrated, we have kids sing a song. We celebrate because that is a day that we celebrate in our Christian world. Now we come to the second greatest event in our Christian church, right? The second greatest event in the church is Pentecost. And right here, like, what? No. Isn't it Christmas? No, it's Pentecost. Because of the sin of the Holy Spirit upon the church. We stand here today because of Pentecost. We stand here today as a product of the Holy Spirit coming to this world and saying, I will build my church. Here we are. We are a product of this. So shortly after rising, raising Jesus from the dead, Jesus went up to, to heaven to rejoin his father. Right? Then the Holy Spirit came down upon the people of God. That's, that's Pentecost. Now the reason that Pentecost is so important to the church is that without the presence and the power, right, of the Holy Spirit, what do you think would happen a long time ago? Church would have died. Yes. Right? Because if we try to do things on our own favor and our own merit, right? Let's just face it. Man is flawed. <laughs> right? Man is, is messed up. And if we did it on our own accord, it wouldn't be a church. Right? It would have failed years ago through the persecutions, through the dark ages, through the 17th century, and probably the 14th century. If we look at the history of the church, there was multiple times in our history where we should not have made it through. Because man got it wrong. Because man destroyed what church was supposed to be. But the reason why the church still stands today is because we have the power and the direction of the Holy Spirit. That's why we are the church. We are a body of believers brought together by God. Isn't that beautiful? I love that. And we see that the church would have died long ago. It is he that gives us an anointing yes. to accomplish what is possible in the flesh. Right? The reason why we stand here, the reason why we as a church are together, are not because I came five years ago, but it's because God brought us out of that miry clay and he molded this church to something. I always tell people, you know, they go, I'm wrapping up my five years, right? In June, I'll be ending my five years, and I'll be beginning my, my six years here at Winfield. Can you believe it's been that long? And y'all haven't ran me out yet. This is awesome, right? And, and I'm so excited for what God's doing in the church. And, and people ask me all the time, man, you know, how's your church? Great. I love it. I'm passionate still because I love what God's doing in the church. They said, oh, man, you're doing a great job. I said, no, I'm not. As much as I want to say it's all me, it's not. I'm happy it's not all me. If I want to do it my way, everything be completely different. But God has directed us to this. God has placed people to speak truth and say we need to go this way. Not this way, but this way. So I get to tell people, man, the church is great. You know why it's great? Because it's not from me or another person, but it's because of the Spirit of God that directs us. I truly believe here at this church that God has been directing the church. That's why I'm really so passionate about this church. Because I believe God has his hand leading us forward. Not one person, not a group of people, but the Holy Spirit leading and guiding the church. Amen? I say amen on that one, right? And I love that. So there are two kinds of special days that the church recognizes. The first is secular, right? Uh, secular days that we kind of celebrate in the church would be Mother's Day, Father's Day, Memorial Day, Independence Day, Thanksgiving. Then our second part that we celebrate is Holy Days, right? Now, Holy Days that we would celebrate is Christmas, Good Friday. We did our first Good Friday service this year, and it was beautiful. I, I so much enjoyed that. Then we also have Easter, right? And then we have Pentecost. Perhaps no event has been more misunderstood than Pentecost. So if I say Pentecost, or I'll say Pentecostal, 
What pops in your head? Tongues, right? Now, you know what's really interesting? A little history 101. Church of Nazareth started in 1903. 1905 was our first kind of uh, general assembly. And 1907, they actually came out with an official name. And the name was Church of the Nazarene, Church of the Nazarene Pentecostal Church. Nazarene Church Pentecostal. We have Pentecostal in our name. Now, and as you know, in the early years, that's when the charismatic movement started to happen, and that's when you had speaking in tongues and stuff like that. And people would come to church and say, oh, you're Pentecostal. Well, no, we're the church Pentecost, right? And sadly, they, they take the name Pentecost, and they think it means charismatic, or they think it means speaking tongues, or just a, a, another form that the church is not. It just, it's a different meaning is what Pentecost means. So when we say Pentecost, people sometimes align Pentecost Sunday with Pentecostal, right? They align it with that aspect. They, they, they either relate to holy rollers, uh, to emotional extremism. That's not it. See, other views as, as a denomination or a movement, and there's many like that that have the name in that, but that's not the definition of Pentecost. I believe that every pastor has a responsibility to carefully explain the meaning and the significance of Pentecost. See, we don't want to miss the power of the church. If we don't explain Pentecost to its truest form, then we truly miss out on what the church is truly meant to be. So the literal meaning of Pentecost, right? Let's give a little pastor a quiz. What does Pentecost mean? How about this? I'll break it down in, in like penta. 50, right? So the literal meaning of Pentecost is 50. And I love that, right? In the Old Testament, it was positioned on the Jewish calendar seven weeks after Passover. It was the Jewish feast of harvest. Now that translates to that was their Thanksgiving, right? So that Pentecost was their Thanksgiving day. The high point of celebration was bringing two loaves of bread made from newly harvested wheat, but symbolized the dedication of the harvest to God. As the loaves were presented to the priests, we, we see the disciples' lives were offered completely to God on Pentecost in the upper room. Right in the upper room, what we see in Acts 1.14, these, all with one mind, were continually devoting themselves to prayer. In preparation for Pentecost, the disciples gathered in an upper room and, and they prayed, right? They were already believers. Christ had ascended and he said, I will send my comforter, the Spirit, to guide you. So this 10-day prayer marathon must have witnessed the, the intimacy of themselves so they could receive the fullness of the Spirit. That's beautiful, right? They, they spent that time preparing for Pentecost. They were preparing for God to speak to them through prayer. They had to empty themselves so they may be filled with the Spirit. And this is the same total commitment as part of the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit in one's personal life. Now, we're Wesleyan Arminian. We're Nazarenes. We believe in sanctification. This is the part where we come up. We believe of giving your whole self Intimating your, intimating your life so that you may be filled fully with the Holy Spirit. That's beautiful. It's scripturally. It's where we get this from. And, and we see how they were on that. And on the Christian calendar, Pentecost occurs seven weeks after Easter. That's because the first Pentecost occurred 50 days after the resurrection. It was on that day the Holy Spirit poured out upon 120 believers in an upper room in Jerusalem as they waited for the baptism. Jesus had promised this event before he ascended into heaven. He said, For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days hence. Then in verse 8 is repeated in Acts, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The first Christian Pentecost was the fulfillment of a prophetic promise in Acts 2, 16 through 18. And 
Peter left no doubt about it. This is what he says. This is what was spoken uh, through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour my spirit upon all flesh. Thank God the comforter has come. Thank the Lord for this moment to where he has poured his spirit out to us. Right? There's two major truths that we have etched in our thinking of today when it comes to Pentecost. You know, I, I believe the, the Protestant faith, our evangelical faith, as we would say, we believe in sanctification, and, and different denominations have different takes, right? Uh, if you're a Calvinist background, how you view it, to if you're a Wesleyan, or if you grew up, whatever, you, you've grown into believe about the fullness of the Spirit in your life. This moment of sanctification to where the, the Pentecost happens in your life, right? Where the Spirit fills you, and you give everything to God. I remember the day that I got down on my knees, and, and I realized that the gravity I was, I realized the state of the chaos, and I said, God, I need you. I, I need all of you. I just want a part of you. I, I want to give you everything I have in my life. Right? This is before I met Courtney. I said, I, I give you my, my faith. I give you my relationships. God, I trust you. And I sat there and wept, and God gave, I gave God everything that I had. And it was at that moment that I felt this, this filling of the Holy Spirit. And you probably felt that in your salvation. You felt that in the moment that you gave God everything in your life. And I felt this, this filling of the Holy Spirit to where I knew that God was with me. I knew that I was in the right with God. I knew that God was going to give me the direction and the strength to do things that I thought were impossible in my life. Right? Graduating college was one of them. And I, I believed that God was going to have his hand and the direction I would go. And I love this. So what we see in the two major truths in our thinking of Pentecost. First, the historic Christian Pentecost was not to be a repeated event. A lot of people today, they, they try to reproduce what happened the day of Pentecost. Right? A lot of today, they, they get a misunderstanding of that. The sights and the sounds are not reproducible. Just as were the events surrounding Christ's birth. Second thing, a personal Pentecost is the birthright of every born-again believer. The infilling of the Holy Spirit is for all of us today. We don't need to travel to the, the Holy Land, right, and jump into the, the, the sea and the valley and pop out, right? You don't need to do all of that. It can take place anywhere. So what's the, the prereqs, right? You know what I'm saying? What does that mean? How do I do that? How do I, how do I experience that Pentecost that to me as a believer, as a born-again believer? Well, seeking, right? That's what the disciples were doing. They were tired of doubts, fear, earthly thinking, selfishness. They wanted all that God could give them, power, cleansing from their sinful self. They needed that. They were seeking they were willing to surrender, yielding one's mind, emotions, and wills, even ambitions of saying, God, it is all yours. Right? You ever, remember that song, Take My Life and Let It Be, Consecrated, Lord, to Thee? It's an old hymn. It's beautiful. And it's truly saying that what we see in Scripture, to give your life completely to God. See, we, we, we're great at sometimes giving half our life to God. We come, God, I, I, I'll give you half my heart. Lord, I love you. Here, here's, here's part of my life. I'll give you maybe my relationship. Uh, forgive me my sins. I want to go to heaven. Just to love you. But then there's a whole other part of your heart that is off to the Holy Spirit. That is off to God. And what we see in Scripture, what we see leading up to Pentecost, and what we see today is God doesn't want half your heart. He doesn't want parts of your life. He wants all your life. Yeah. God wants all of you. He wants you to give him everything. That's surrender. You need to be willing to say, God, here is everything. In that brokenness, you realize there is nothing else that matters than giving your life completely to God. So when you do that, when you seek and you surrender, say, God, here is everything. Here's the products. Right? This is what we see of the early church. The disciples, 120 in that room, 
what we see, the products of their love. First is purity of the heart. Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. If you want to be inwardly happy, then make sure you have a clear conscience, right? The purity of the heart. I mean, that's the biggest deal in our world today. Did you hear about uh, another shooting, right? Did you hear about how there was abuse? Did you hear about how there was another moment of sickness in our world to where it was a heart? We have a heart issue in our nation. I believe that. I believe we have a heart issue to where people in their heart are, are calloused, have hate. Right? We've been talking about hate and anger. And it's because it's a heart issue. Because people don't know what it is to give everything to God. They don't know what to give their whole heart to God. See, when there's purity of the heart, when it comes in and, and God takes control of everything you have, it comes in your life and he wraps his arms around and he says, I've got control of your life. Then that gives you power as the second thing. Acts 1.8, and you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So what kind of power? Is it like Power Rangers, right? You can fly, right? That would be cool, but no. Right? Is, is it the kind of power where you're just like, you all of a sudden you can, like, you can just move things, you get stronger? No. It is the most important power we can have. Pray, right? Acts 4.31 says the early spirit-filled believers, and then they pray, and the place was shaken. When spirit-filled folks begin to pray, things begin to happen. I believe that when we begin to live a life of prayer, Amen. when we begin to commit our life to prayer, things happen. Amen? Yes. Amen. When we see that in our life, we see that in my life, when we begin to pray for God to work, God works. Right? And so in that, through the purity of the heart, the power to receive is prayer. Right? Sinners, they're going to tremble with conviction. Saints, they shake with conviction. And I believe that, that, that hell shakes with fear when Christians begin to pray with the reverence of God completely in them. Amen. I think also power to overcome. This is a sinful world. Can't even go to the mall anymore without being tempted. You never realize that, you know, food agencies. I'm not going to lie. I love food. I'm trying to stop. Man, it is so hard. You know why? It's a mind game they do with you. You ever notice that the callers for like Wendy's, McDonald's, Taco Bell, pretty much any fast food place, they all have the same yellow, brown, or, or, or red, right? Those are signifiers and visual signifiers to create hunger. It's how smart our world is. They use visual indicators to make you want something. What does it mean? That makes me want to what? Eat. You ever watch a commercial on TV and you go, man, that sounds good. We've all been there, right? Now you go to the mall, right? You go buy a Victoria's Secret. Lord, some of us have clothes on those girls, right? You go to the mall, you look, and there's their stores and, and things that are trying to appeal to your what? Your carnal self, right? They're trying to appeal to your, uh, your sinful, the part of your human side, not your spiritual side. So this world we live in today we find a struggle. We find a, a real struggle in the things that we face. Sin. And with the power, that moment is that God, I give you everything. And when Christ fills your soul and your heart completely, you're able to have the power to say, temptation flee. Right? right? Failure, there is no failure. Because you know that you're complete in God. Right? You're no longer in sorrow because you have the hope of the Lord. You're no, you're no longer in disappointment at life, but you have what? Hope to continue to move forward. No matter where you are, you have the power to overcome what this world can throw at you. No one can be a real victorious person without the Spirit's help. Right? How about the, the power to persist? The early Spirit-filled Christians, they didn't take any thought of giving up. If you would look at the early Christians, they got on fire for Jesus. Whew. I tell you, they got on fire. And what did they do? They started the church. We are a product of that day. Isn't that awesome? That's our heritage. That right there is our heritage as a church. We came out, you know why? 
Because then you're just going to say, yeah, yeah, Jesus. I'm going home. You know, peace out. They said, yeah, Jesus. Let's go share. Man, let me tell you about Jesus. Well, I'm going to go to this place over here I've never been to, and I'm going to plant a church. Well, I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to plant a church over here. Well, then you go there. And they spread out. And they started the church because they were on one mission. To spread the love, the faith, the hope, and the power of God and his church. And we are a product of that. You know, so you have purity of heart, right? You, you have power. Next you have is generosity. Verse 45. This is the very nature of God. The spirit of Christ within us causes us to be just like God. Just think of the generosity of God, right? This is something in your life to, to really practice, right? God gave us more sky than man can see, more sea than he can sell, more sun than he can bear to watch, more stars than he can stare at, right? More breath than he can breathe, more yield than he can sow, more love than he can know. I saw that this week. I was like, there, that's a beautiful part in talking about how we see God. Now the question is, how do we get this kind of purity, power, generosity of saying, thank you, Lord, right? Thank you for what you've done. If you see the early church, they went to the fullest extent by literally providing for each other. The meal was to make sure that they weren't going hungry because they cared for each other as a church. Same thing as the baby dedication and, and praying for the graduates. Is they supported each other. They, they, they ate with each other. And they made sure that they were in good favor with each other. Now, I love that part there. It means they weren't talking bad about each other. It means they weren't bad mouthing each other. But they were in good favor with everyone. Because they saw the generosity of the Spirit and of who God is. God gave them life, purpose, meaning. God gave creation. You ever want to see the, the generosity of God? All of a sudden, go out in the woods. Go out in the lake. We're going to vote for a day. Just sit on the water. Go out and look at creation and see how wonderfully made God created you and his works. Right? Then you see the generosity of God. And you leave that in your life and say, man, I want to portray that to other people. See, we get it the same way they got it. By asking for it by faith. By asking God to burn out that which is blocking his power and receiving him in his fullness. Right. You know, in my life, when I was talking about that, it was in my life, I was trying to figure out my calling. I was trying to figure out my direction. I was not, a, I believed in God. I said, God, you were great. And God, you were awesome. Hey, Jesus. I was that guy. But there are still parts of my life that I was thinking, I'm not going to give to you because I don't like where you want me to go. You know, you know like your God's like, I'm going to take you here. You're like, mm -hmm. ain't going over there, you know. That's a conversation I have to have in my head. Is I knew that God wanted something for me, had a plan and a purpose for me. And I was standing there because I'm hard-headed, right? And I'm stubborn because that's like anybody else, right? And I'm sitting there going, no way, I'm sorry. And then I started thinking about God's love. Then I started thinking about his purpose, the meaning of Pentecost. Then I started to think about the power of God. And I was sitting there, I was feeling empty. There was a battle raging in me because I had hit stuff in closets. And I was saying, you can have the house, but you can't have the closets, right? And, and I threw everything in, and I thought it was going to be fine. Until Christ comes and goes, knocks on the door, and says, I, I need to clean the closets. You know, I need to clean out your junk. And I was like, no, I don't want to. Don't you get in there, right? Anybody ever had a grown up a junk closet, right? I'm not saying we have one, right? Just say, you know, and that's in our life. Sometimes we have stuff where we don't want to give to God. Sometimes we have that where we, we try to block it off from God. We think we do a good job of hiding it from God. And there's Christ in our life saying, I want all of you. Trust me. Give me everything. And it's easier said than done. Yeah. We're willing to give God half our heart. We give God our full, uncontrolled, whatever it may be, of our lives to Him. 
That's being sold out to Christ. Always heard it like this. You know, I'm a car guy, and you know, I think of it in, in, a, in a car aspect. Sometimes we get in the driver's seat, and we're willing to pick up God and put him in the passenger seat. Right? We're driving, and we're driving, we're just enjoying it, you know, the talk, the conversation. And God says, All right, I want the car. And we go, Ah. All right, so we're willing to give him the driver's seat, but maybe we can sit in the passenger seat. So we get out, so we can be in the passenger seat, so we can kind of gauge what he's going to do. So we can say, oh, turn here, backseat driver, right? We get out, we get the keys, the title to God, and he says, get in the trunk and trust me. And we go, oh, you have until then, right? And that's how I'm kind of viewed in my life is when we get out, God wants the, the title to the car, the keys. And he wants us just to jump in the, the trunk and he says, I'll take you anywhere you want. But you've got to trust me. You've got to follow my direction, my leading. Yeah. And if you do that, I will provide for you. You do that, I tell you, you will live a happy life. You know, it's not going to be easy, but I will give you the power to overcome temptation and sin. Believe that. I believe that we can face our, our hardness as it is human, our sinful nature, with Christ completely in control of our life. It's what we call sanctification. It's what we call holiness. Well, when I say live a holy life, it means live a life completely devoted to God. That's what it's about. Today, God's probably here and he, He's speaking to your heart, saying, Enough of giving this half hearted effort. I don't want half of you, I want all of you. There are some things in our life that we put in the closet. We say, you can have the house, but you can't have the closet. Right? Are we here today saying, I can give you everything? See, this is the thing I want to ask today. When the disciples were born again, they received all the Spirit. When they yielded themselves fully to God, the Spirit got all of them. When we are saved, Christ became their co-pilot. When they were filled with the Holy Spirit, Christ became the pilot. Does the Spirit have all of you? Or is Christ just your pilot? Co-pilot. Is Christ just your co-pilot? I'm going to end with this. Let me just come play a little. This week I was reading a, a, a Bible uh, expositor because he's Scottish. It's awesome. His name is Alexander McLaren. And he says this. I want to leave you with this. We may have as much of God as we will. Christ puts the keys of the treasure chamber into our hand and bids us take all that we want. If a man is admitted into the bullion vault of a bank and told to help himself and comes out with one cent, Whose fault is that that he is poor? I love that. Christ has given us this beautiful day of Pentecost where we are as a church, where we're called to be completely devoted to God. A unified body that is loving each other in unity and in full support, right? The favor of other people meets our favor of happiness. That's really what we see. But the only way that we can be a church the only way that we can be a group of believers that we see in the church in Acts is for us to be completely sold out to Christ. Right? No longer about me. No longer about I. No longer about what I want. It's about what God wants. It's about who God is in our life. I'll tell you this day that I decided that God was no longer my co pilot, but my everything. It was everything. And I gave God, I said, you know what? I don't want to go, but God, I will follow you. And I'll tell you what, it's been the most blessed thing of my life. Has it been easy? Lord, no. But I'll tell you this, I sleep every night with peace in my heart knowing I'm in God's will. I sleep every night knowing that no matter what happens, God be praised. Today, is God everything in your life? Or is he only half the things in your life? Does he have your heart? Only parts of your heart. I ask you today just to stand. Court, can you just sing something? And meditate on it. It's got everything.
or it's just God himself.